So let's apply our theory of technological change and see how information communication technology evolved. For example, we could measure performance on the y-axis in terms of the number of calculations per second you can do for one US dollar. So with one US dollar, how many calculations per second can you buy on computers? And we track here the 1900s until the year 1980. And we can say that our, see that our indicator goes up to 1000. And most of the progress, almost all of the progress happened basically in the last decade from 1970 to 1980. So let's go a decade further until 1990. We see that the performance increased from 1,000 to 10,000, the maximal performance. And again, most of the progress basically happened in the last decade. So let's go a decade further until the year 2000. Now we can see that our maximal performance increased until 1 million. And again, most of the progress happened in the last decade. It seems like always all the progress just happens in the last decade. Well, that's one of the signatures of exponential growth. If we take the logarithm on the y-axis, we can see here that there are very large steps between each one of the horizontal lines. So this is the logarithm of base 10. We have here our 1,000, 10,000, 1 million. And there's a very straight line uh, during the decades of 1980, 1990, 2000. So computational power has increased and an exponential rate actually since the 1900s. It's an impressively straight line that we can detect here. The driver of this impressive progress since the 1960s has been Moore's law, actually. That's how it's called. The driver has been that it's possible to pack always more transistors on one microchip. And that's basically by making transistors smaller and smaller. So in 1965, Gordon Moore, a co-founder of the company Intel, said that the complexity for minimum component cost has increased at a rate of roughly a factor of two per year. Basically, he said every year computational power doubles with regard to its cost. Now, there are many versions of Moore's law out there. Say it doubles every year, every year and a half, every two years, every three years. In the big picture, it doesn't really matter what are the details. Fact of the matter is that computational power doubles and this doubling leads to this exponential progress that you can see here over different processors there, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, Pentium 4, and so forth. And it's still ongoing. Now, many people say Moore's law will come to an end because this is actually an example of what? Disruptive or continuous innovation? It's a perfect example of continuous innovation because we just talk about transistors and we always make them smaller and smaller and smaller. And we coming to the end of the possibility to exploit this technological space because transistors are getting so small that they get to the size of atoms. And beneath the level of atoms, there are some very weird quantum effects. So we cannot really use those to compute. They are notoriously random. So there are other ways we can still increase computational power, we can just have more chips. We don't make them smaller or we make them three-dimensional or a disruptive innovation will come along. For example, a quantum computer or biological computers or a laser co or some kind of other innovation. So, But for now, this continuous stream of innovation through making things smaller has to come to an end eventually. So let's have a visual look on how far Moore's law has gotten us. Uh, as I said, the year 1970, 2-3 is usually seen as the beginning of the digital age with the invention of the microprocessor. This is the one of the first popular computers, the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center computer. And this was one of the first video games called Pong. And as you can see, uh, it was a little entertaining. You could sometimes even score, but still very primitive. Then 10 years later, Windows came along, the first operating system. That was a huge advancement. So before that, also when I learned to use computers at the beginning, you basically only had code. So with this code, you were writing things like, from this point of the line, copy the content until this 
point of the line and then paste it into line number this on the position that with the windows you had windows suddenly yeah. um, the mouse became much more functional and it set the standard of what we nowadays understand as an operating system also the first video games came along pac-man mario brothers and so forth then 10 years later, multimedia started to set in with games like SimCity, which is still around, and the first role-playing games, Monkey Island was a big hit, and Lara Croft, the Tomb Raider, came along as well. She still looked a little bit skinny, which changed 15 years later. She looked much better, and by 2009, also the TV industry had started to enter the digital age with movies like The Matrix and Avatar, and for example, video games producer took advantage of digital interactivity with games like Wii, where you were recording your movement. And then by 2014, video games producers spent 200, 300 million dollars employing 1,000 people to produce video games, and these video games earned a billion dollars, a thousand million dollars during the first one, two, three days after the launch. So a lot of progress has been done since the uh, early 70s. So if we look now at our theory of doubling, let's see what that means. That means that in 1970, the beginning of 1970s, uh, let's say we started with, with one and since then we doubled. And if we take Moore's law seriously, we say that every one, two, three, let's say every two years, uh, performance doubles. So we start with one, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, and have a close look what happens here. So actually what happens is that at each step, all the progress that has been done since the beginning is added on again. This means that Moore's law implies that every time you double, you make as much progress as you have done since the beginning of time. So that means during the next doubling rate, during the next two or three years, we may make as much progress as we have done since the early 70s. In other words, if back here, you would have been able to predict this kind of world, then you should be more or less able to predict what will happen in the next two or three years because that's the amount of computational power that is added to it. So doubling means that at each step you grow as much as you have grown from the beginning. That is a very important observation to wrap your mind around and even the most visionary industry leader and government authorities often have problems with really understanding and appreciating the brutal power of exponential growth. So I say it again, doubling, exponential doubling like in Moore's law means that during each doubling, which in Moore's law is every two, three years, you make as much progress as you have made since the beginning of this entire process. And that's also why when you look at these graphs without a logarithm, it seems like all the progress we've ever made has just been made very recently, during the last decade, for example. So that's actually where that comes from. Uh, think about it a little bit more. It's important to understand that. So Moore's law basically has to do with computation, since it basically says you can pack more transistors on one microprocessor. So you can make microprocessors smaller and smaller and, and, and smaller. And we say that ICT, information communication technology, also includes communication and storage technologies. Now they have different drivers, but they're also mainly driven by a logic of Moore's law and by Moore's law as well, since they interact with computational devices, which make them more efficient. So we can now look at the different evolutionary trajectories of computation, communication, and storage. Here, for example, we have computation. You see different technological paradigms that are characterized by disruptive innovations among them, and within them, there is continuous innovation. So for example, you have manual calculation here. That here was a Japanese grandmaster of the abacus, and you can see that uh, a grandmaster on an abacus, these are the wooden beads calculator, was still more effective than 
an artificial computer until the 1950s. Then after the vacuum tubes and especially after the transistor, the power of artificial computation just took off and digital computation with a microprocessor just hit us off this chart in this exponential logic. Keep in mind, there's a logarithm here on the y-axis. We can look at a similar logic for communication. So here we have traditional postal communication, a mailman, which was the traditional way of, of tele distance communicating. Then we have here the telegraph. We can here see the telephone, the fax machine, radio broadcasting, and again, digital communication basically kicked us off the chart. So here again, you can appreciate different technological paradigms characterized by disruptive innovation and continuous innovation on the basis of one same technological space. For example, radio and television also became better over the decades. And something very similar applies to storage technology. So you have here different storage technology, hard disks, and RAM technology, and you can really see a very smooth evolution. I show you these graphs to let you know that you can study the evolution of technology in a way that is very similar to how biologists study the evolution of species. And you can see and detect very smooth technological trajectories. And once you understand them, that also helps you to guide your business strategy, for example, you don't want to be surprised by uh, a new turn in a technological trajectory. And also for governments, it's very important to understand how technology evolves.